Income tax 2022-2023 child and dependent care expenses tax software example. Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Here we are in our example form 1040 populated with Lacert tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to the form 1040 related forms and schedules at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Starting point, single filer, Mr. Anderson, living in 90210 Beverly Hills. We got the W-2 income at 100000 12950 standard deduction, 87050 for the taxable income page. Number two, 14774 for the tax calculation, 15000 withheld. Bottom line, 226. Now we'll go back on over to page one. Our focus is on child and dependent care expenses. So let's first add a dependent, which will typically move someone up if they were a single filer to the head of household filer. We'll have the child tax credit, which is different than what we're talking about here, child and dependent care expenses. And then we'll jump into those items. Okay, so here we have it. Now we have added Joe Anderson as a son qualifies for the child tax credit we're going to be saying which is not our focus here it's similar name we're focused on the child independent care expenses support accounting instruction by clicking the link below giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website broken out by category further broken out by course each course then organized in a logical reasonable fashion making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. But we'll see how the normal things kind of integrate together when you've got a child. And so we're going to then say, okay, page one, actually it should be head of household now. Okay, I fixed it. I fixed it. So it's head of household now. So now everything else is the same, but the standard deductions at 19,400 get us, gets us to the 80,600 page number two. Then we have the tax at 11,855. And then we've got the uh, child tax credit. That's the one thing that has changed now. So now we're going to tack on to that. The other benefit of possibly having the child is that you, you can have expenses related to the care of the child. So normally when we think about this from a, just a practical data input uh, standpoint, most software, you'll think about two kinds of sides to this. We're going to have one, the child that, it, or that you're claiming the expenses for, and then we're going to have the institution that we're going to have to be claiming the, the expenses, whoever did the child care that we're going to need the, the number for. So let's first, I only have one dependent here, so it's pretty easy. We're going to say, yeah, it was for Joe Anderson here. And then uh, the qualified dependent care expenses. Let's put something over the threshold. It's going to cap it at 3,000. I'm going to go over the threshold for now so we can see that cap and go up to 5,000. And then the other side of things we need to do is the institution. So I'm going to, I just made up an institution here. So, uh, so what we need is the name of the institution, the address of the institution, and you need the institution's EIN number. If it is an institution, if it's an individual, then they might have the social security number. So that's the typical information you're going to need. Notice here that I'm populating as well the total amount paid to care provider in 2022. So because there's only one uh, dependent, it's pretty straightforward. It can get a little bit confusing when you have multiple dependents that are possibly are being taken care of, of, of by the same provider. So you can imagine, for example, having two kids and maybe we'll test that out shortly with the same care provider and so you paid five thousand each for each individual kid or something like that but let's start here for now so i'm going to go back on over and say okay obviously we're going to we're going to imagine that the care was provided to help uh to generate the to allow mr anderson here to work and because mr anderson is single you would think that the care provider would be you know more easy for to to fit that qualification although it does get a little bit confusing when you're talking about say 
uh, it, what's the primary goal that you're sending the child for the care for? Is it for the care or for some you know other purpose like educational purpose or something like that? But we're gonna we're just gonna practice the, the data input now. So then on page number two, page one is much the same. Page number two, now you got this other $600 that's been pulled in from schedule three, line eight. So if we go to schedule three, line eight, here it is. This is the credit for child independent care expenses from form 22, I mean 2441. So we could go to form 2441. This is the child independent care expenses. So we've got uh, the name up top, uh, social security number, and then here's the care provider's name. This is the person or organizations who provide the care, the address, the number, that's what the IRS typically wants, was the care provider your household employee in 2022? In this case, we're saying no. The amount paid, $5,000, we're saying. And obviously you wanna have the support for that in the event that you had an audit or something. You'd wanna be able to support that, that number. And then down here, you can see it's basically gonna be capped at 3,000 where it says, add the amount on column D to line two, don't enter more than 3,000 if you had one qualifying person or 6,000 if you had two or more persons. So it's gonna be capped at 3,000 for one, 6,000 for two or more. Earned income is the 100,000 that's pulling in from uh, the form 1040. And then basically you can you can see they're taking the table down here. So it capped out at 3,000 and then they're taking the table, which is gonna take some fraction of the allowable credit, not 5,000 what we paid, but the cap in this case of the 3,000 is looking at this table to see that we're at the 100,000. So you can see obviously as the income goes up, it's gonna be uh, having a, a smaller number that's gonna be used and it's picking up the 43,000 and over the 20. So 3,000 times the 20% is the uh, 600. And uh, then we could have a limitation for the tax liability because I don't believe this is a, this is a uh, non-refundable, not a refundable credit. And that's what's pulling into the line three, which is pulling in to the first page of, I'm sorry, the second page of the form 1040. Now, obvious, now, the other thing to note here is that you do need to have uh, income for the calculation. So let's imagine you didn't have any earned income and you had some other source of income like interest or something maybe. So let's say earned income is, is gone. Well, then we're going to say then you might have had like interest income, like dividends or something. Interest income was 10000 let's say. 10,000 interest income and that's it. And then, so you can see now it's not calculating because you, you, we didn't have any income. And the point of the credit is that you had income and uh, and and the, the, the you're paying the expenses in order to generate income, but you didn't have any income and passive income doesn't really count, right? Even if I made the passive income 100,000, then uh, generally still, you, you may have the child tax credit uh, pops up here, but we don't see that $600 for the other credit because that's all passive income. Uh, it's not active income. It's not in this first section of the income, but down here in the passive area. All right, now let's imagine that you had a decent amount of income, 20,000, but still with the standard deduction at the 19,400, taxable income would only be at $600. So that would mean the tax is quite low at $61. And then you could see what, what we, we still have the calculation here, but it's being limited to the $61 right here, $61 from uh, schedule three. And then if I go to 2441, just to look at that calculation, we paid the 5,000, we have the $3,000 limit. And now you have a, a different rate that's being used because we didn't have as high of an income. So it would have been at the 960, but it capped it at the 61 because it's non-refundable, right? It's not taking the liability below zero. It's, it's, big, it's taking the tax being paid down to zero. Now it's kind of interesting, the interplay between a credit like this credit and the child tax credit, which, is, which has similar uh, you know, 
characteristics to it because the child's going to be involved with it. And the child tax credit does have a refundable component to it. So notice it basically allows you the, uh, the credit for child independent care and then the child tax credit, you have the additional child tax credit, which is the refundable portion of the child tax credit. So some of these get a little bit messy when you think about the interplay between uh, the different credits, especially when you get into like refundable and non-refundable portions of the credits. All right, let's add another person. So now we've got another dependent. And then I'm going to jump on over here and say now we've got uh, two dependents. So I'm going to add another one. Let's say we're paying for both of them. And let's say we're paying them to the same institution, 5,000 each. So I'm going to say qualified dependent care, 5,000 each, we'll say, but it's going to the same institution. So I'm going to have the same institution having 10,000. So now I've got two people, right? So you, you might have them going to two different institutions or you could have them going to the same institution, which might look something like this. So if we jump back to the form 1040, then we're going to say, all right, Anderson, two dependents now. Uh, 20, let's bring the income back up to 100,000, 100,000 on the income. So we don't hit any limit there. And so I'm going to go boom and then hundred thousand page number two. So we have the 4,000 for the child tax credits. And now we're up to the 1,200, which is pulling ultimately from the two, four, four, one. So now we've got the, the institution amount of the 10,000 to two people, two children five and five, we got limited to the, not the 3000 for one, but 6,000, but it's going to cap at 6,000. Even if we go above that, even though we paid 10,000 and then it's going to be picking up that 20% based on the qualified amount, which is the 6,000. And that's where we get the 1,200. We don't have any, uh, we still have tax. So we're not going to hit a limit because of the non-refundable. That's what's pulling over. Now, if I add one more, let's do one more here because why not at this point? So we'll add another one. Uh, not there. Hold on a second. I'm going to add another one here. So we'll say another, and this is going to be Eric, Eric. And we'll say on the second one, we'll say we paid for Eric another 5,000 to the same institution. So we're going to say, all right, qualified 5,000, same institution. And so now this is at 15,000. Now you would think if they capped it three, three and three, we would get three, six, nine, but no, it's still going to cap it at that 1,200. So if I go to page one, we're at three kids. We paid all three of them. We still got the child tax credit, which is at 6,000. Uh, but we're still at the 1,200 here for the child and dependent care expenses. So if I go down to the 2441, then you can see that we're still here because it capped it at the 6,000 for two or more children. All right, so we have a, a similar situation if married. So let's go to the married situation, but we would have to have both spouses working would be the general idea in order to take the credit. So for example, here, I just switched it up to married, uh, but I didn't, I didn't assign the W-2 wages to, to, to the spouse, Jane here. So now we still have the three dependents, 100,000. Now the, the standard deductions at 25,9, getting us to the 74,1, page number two, we still get the 6,000 child tax credit but we don't have anything being calculated for the other credits because I didn't assign any income to the other spouse. So this is where it becomes important in tax software to, to assign the income. So let's imagine they both earned 50,000 with two separate W-2 forms. W-2. If I don't, if I don't check off, notice that if I do this 50,000 and 50,000, and let's say that these were two W-2s for, for two different spouses. That's legitimate, but I didn't properly mark off which W-2 is for which. Oftentimes it doesn't matter because they're one entity for taxes, right? They're one financial entity. So it's still 100,000, everything looks correct. But the problem is here, this particular credit is gonna be based on whether or not each individual spouse had earned income. 
So I have to make sure that I go and say, I'm checking this one off for the spouse so that I can assign that to the spouse so that they can have their their earned income so that we, the, the credit will then populate within the software. So now if I go back to the 2441, we've got the same kind of scenario, but the idea being that that both spouses have to be working because if it was a one spouse working household, a traditional household, you would think that the, the other spouse could take care of the kids and you wouldn't need the expenses in order to work. Whereas a single family household, you would think that uh, they that would be the case. Again, it's kind of funny the way these these laws populate. You can you can see that makes sense to one degree because you're like that, but it also kind of disincentivizes marriage again because because the you know anyways. So now the other thing to be aware of is you might get say a benefit if you're if you're working for an employer and you get a benefit say on a W-2 that the employer is paying for dependent care. And remember when you have an employee employer kind of situation, uh, oftentimes what the employer can have their money go a little bit further if they can give money that would be have a tax benefit to the employee, like a 401k plan. The 401k plan then has the income not included in box one, so the employer is able to pay the employee without having that significant tax benefit or at least by deferring it. So if you could do that with other things like like a dependent care or something like that, or have the employer be able to pay and not include it in income, that would be great. But it gets a little bit confusing then if you have a credit that could be possible and then you've got this dependent care benefit. So let's imagine, for example, box 10 of the W-2 has has dependent care benefit of 6,000. So then if I go back on over, notice it's limiting the credit here uh, to the 1,000. So we still said that we paid uh, the 15,000, but, and then the 5,000 each, but it says here, add the amounts on line D to enter 3,000 if you had one or qualifying person, 6,000 if you had two or more, uh, if you complete part three, so it's going to be the 1,000. So if we go to part three, then dependent care benefits, we have the 5,000, da, 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 won't go through uh, the whole thing. But uh, the general idea is that we had to limit it to the 1,000. And by the way, the reason it got limited to the 1,000 instead of uh, the 6,000 wiping it out entirely is because generally, if I, if I go back on over here, usually this number will be kind of capped at 5,000 because you can get the dependent care benefits that go over the 5,000, but then uh, that amount over the 5,000, the 1,000 would generally be included in box one of the W-2, which means it would be subject to the, the uh, federal income tax, right? So the 5,000 amount might be in box 10 and possibly not in box one, therefore not subject to the federal income tax. That's the part you're getting the benefit from. Now also note we have the age test for the children, but if they were over 12 and disabled at the time, so the age test, uh, the you know, under, under 13 was it, uh, the age test. So if they were over that age, but disabled, then uh, that would be kind of a, a exception to that general age test rule. And then you also wanna be looking into the idea of if the care provider is the taxpayer's household employee, because you wanna make sure that if they, you have a household employee, that you're properly calculating this credit, as well as properly dealing with the household employee situation and seeing if you need to be dealing with like payroll taxes, social security and Medicare and uh, that kind of stuff. Also remember that the EIN number here would be the typical thing that you would get from an institution if it's a if it's a institution of some kind other than that then you would think the it would be a social security number an ssn